They said if they <laughs> saw me, they would arrest me. I think it was last year or the year before your Instagram got deleted. Because I do fan art. <laughs> when like the staff comes up to your table looking real angry, but don't say anything, but then they buy something, throws my brain for a loop every oh, time. Yeah, yeah, my hands are like this. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, of course, would you like a discount? <laughs> Today, I'm joined by Kei Hasu, a prolific artist, a veteran of the artist alley space, and if you've ever been to a convention, you're probably familiar with his work already. When did you start doing conventions? Technically, I guess I started in 2013. Okay, I, wow. I didn't I didn't actually get into my first convention where I was like inside the hall until 2014. Oh, interesting. Yeah. What does that mean? So I used to actually, the way I started was just camping outside on the street and uh, setting up in front of the show and like oh. getting kicked out by security. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, at one point I was banned from the Anaheim Convention Center and they said <laughs> if they saw me, they would arrest me. Oh no, oh, okay. What made you, <laughs> did you just like not know how to apply or could you not get in? Like what was the, what's yeah. the story behind yeah, that? I didn't know anything about this scene. I actually just kind of got dragged into it. The whole application process wasn't even like in my mind, I guess. Gotcha, gotcha. But yeah, for a while I was really broke. So that's all I really could do. Like I honestly couldn't even afford to get a table until 2014. Mm. So it took like eight months-ish to even like be able to come up with the money to apply for a table. I see, I see. And then, uh, I mean, you know, like applications take a while to go through and then yeah. they show you. So like, so once I started making a little bit, just a few hundred dollars I, and, and I could spare it, I just put it into applying to a show and paying for it. I was basically trying everything up until that point. So it's just like another thing to try. I gotcha. Yeah. I think, I think I started in 2016. I did my first show nice. that year. I only did the one show. Nice. Which one? Um, it was Kineticon, which is like some weird, obscure show in Connecticut. Shout out to Kineticon. <laughs> um, it's gone downhill from now, so not shout out to Kineticon. <laughs> but, okay. but uh, I mean, back then it was a good show for what it was. And I think that weekend I was probably making, I don't know why I thought about it like this, probably because I was working like three minimum wage jobs on the side. But I was like, oh, I'm making like $15 an hour at this show, not counting like oh, the cost of being there. I was there. totally thinking the same way, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, this is crazy. I yeah. can make yeah. $15 an hour yeah, yeah. on my art. Oh, for sure. The lack of perspective was very motivating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I feel like I'm just dumb enough to, to keep going. I feel like... You know, like if you think too much and you're like doubting or you're second guessing yourself too much, mm -hmm. you're putting like too many stoppers in the way. I'm like just ignorant and just blissful enough to be like, I think it'll work if I keep going. I think if I had known that people were making like thousands of dollars a weekend, I probably would have been way more discouraged. I think so too. Yeah, exactly. I think I would have as well. So it's been about 11 years since you were getting kicked out of the Anaheim yeah. Convention Center. Shout out to Anaheim. <laughs> Have you been back? Like, oh, yeah. officially? Oh my god, there's so many shows at the Anaheim Convention Center. <laughs> there's so many, but I mean, I don't know, it's probably water under, under the bridge. How many shows do you think you've done in your, like, uh, career of conventioning? Um, if you had to estimate. I, maybe, like, more than 500. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. More than 500. And... I think I just recently hit 100. Really? Oh, yeah. wow. Nice. That's awesome. Do you, like, how many shows did you do, like, last year? Kids now. Okay. So after I had kids, yeah, I have had to scale down. I'll probably show up to maybe, like, 18. That's still a lot. Yeah. And I just like it. I don't know. It just really... So do you like, like, the social aspect of it, or...? It's like, it's literally how I recharge. I love the community aspect. Like, after show three of a year, I don't know, I'm just so tired of, like seeing all these anime titty body pillows all day or something. You know you'll, what I mean? You'll get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see a Dustin version in 10 years. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, if nothing else works out. So I got a bunch of questions from the community. So I thought we could kind of answer them together because of all your expertise and time within the community, if you're down for that. Okay, yeah, that's fair. The first one is original work versus fan art. Do you think new artists who don't have a social media following could do well selling their original stuff? Yeah. Are there certain shows that original work does just as well as fan art? Can you survive with no social media following? That one I will say yes, like 100% mm -hmm. yes. Because I feel like the experience in person at a show versus online are two separate things. Like, So yeah. really everyone's just there to see what your work is doing for them at that moment in that I 100% agree. 
I agree. You know? I think from like, when I started shows, I had no Instagram following to now where I have a decent Instagram following and I don't see much like benefit of having a large following at a show. No, it's none. it's just the quality of work, the presentation and who's there. Yeah, like I think like, you know, for some people, they have a really big following. Some people do come and seek them out. I think it's a smaller percentage than people realize. It's much, much smaller. Yeah, you might just get like maybe a hundred people that come, maybe a hundred people at like yeah. a big show that come by. I think when it comes to like the fan art thing, and you can disagree with me or oh, but in at any time, but I think like the reason I think fan art does so well is you immediately connect with it because you recognize it. Now that's not saying that original work can't connect in the same way. Sure. Like, or I sell mainly original work. I also have a little fan art, but like if I do a painting of a sunset, everybody knows what a sunset is and they're gonna connect with it just mm -hmm. like they might connect with Pokemon. Mm -hmm. Like everybody at that show probably knows what Pokemon is. So like if I'm doing a piece that can connect with somebody that's not attached to an IP in the same way and have that visceral, like emotional, like connection, then I think original artwork can do just as well. Yeah, I totally agree with that. This is universal things like plants or animals. Or, yeah, yeah. Or women. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. That's like <laughs> throughout history. <laughs> <laughs> there's been plants, every, animals, and women. Yeah. There's been every iteration of a female nude because it's just like, is universal. Yeah, things like samurai, so, sushi, like. So I think the question is more like, people see that fan art is connecting with people instantly, but they're not always understanding why it's connecting with people. Like they're like, oh, it's recognizable, but other things can do that too. At the end of the day, if your heart is telling you like, I have these original ideas, you do that. Don't, don't feel like you have to do fan art yeah, just yeah. because that's like the only way to make money. Mm -hmm. there's, there are two different paths, but yeah, both can be really successful. Mm -hmm. If anything, I feel like the original uh, path definitely has more potential. Harder work up front, but longevity wise and how far you can go, I think it's has way more potential. Interesting, yeah, okay, I think yeah. fan art, you can like, fan art is more like a fast um, fast gain, but the, the cap is kind of, you know. I see, I see. Yeah. I think, you know, I think people can do both. I just wouldn't want to discourage anyone because I've, I've seen comments of people just like, oh man, like it sucks that like fan art's the only thing that's doing well because I actually really just want to do this. I'm like, oh no, you should definitely do that. Like, yeah, yeah. That's what you're I don't think do. they're understanding yeah, that's what you're why the thing is doing well yeah, yeah. necessarily. Should we go into the spicy ones? So the question is the legality of fan art. How do so many artists get away when you know, copyright is an issue with a lot of the IPs of this fan art people are selling within like artist alleys or dealer halls. I don't know about the how do people get away with it part. Um, some people do and some people don't. I know Etsy's like pretty big on shutting things down. Yeah, yeah. I can uh, go first if you want. You okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I, I think experience. I think when it comes to like fan art, like there's obviously some IPs that are very protective. Like you see like Disney and a lot of the like Western companies, not all of them are super aggressive. So I think that becomes a lot more risky, but I think, you know, a lot more Eastern companies, especially with like anime conventions, view fan art as like free promotion. And some of those companies even have put out statements saying that they don't care. Not all of them. Like people don't always consider that. Like if you're if you want to do fan art of a certain thing and you don't necessarily want to be at risk, like see if that company True. has like made a public statement about it. Because I did Ghibli fan art at one point in Ghibli. This is kind of a fun, weird gray area. Put out a statement years ago saying like they liked the community input and oh, they didn't nice. really care. Oh, cool. Um, but then Disney is now the distributor of Ghibli products oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the US. Yeah. So like, you know, when I was selling Ghibli stuff on Etsy, Disney takes it down. Right. Like, I don't know if Disney, just because they're the distributor, do they actually have the, like, legality to make me, like, to go after me for it when the actual studio has already claimed that they weren't going to? I don't know. I actually just never think about this stuff. <laughs> Genuinely just don't think about it. So, yeah, you probably won't get, like, a, a clear, like oh yes, you're allowed to do this and you're completely protected. And that's kind of, I feel like that's kind of where it's at with most of the fan art stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, you don't really have um, the final say in these things. Yeah, you yeah. know, uh, I didn't know that about the the Ghibli thing. I did hear about Genshin and how they're cool with it. So yeah, if you want like if you want like complete safety and you want to do some sort of like protection, then yeah, probably go that way. Yeah, and I mean those companies still own those IPs, so they can change their mind at any time. Yeah. So yeah, even like totally if it's can. cool today, yeah, they could change their mind tomorrow. Yeah, it's their property. But you know if. 
that's something you're worried about, definitely kind of look into that avenue if you really want to do, you know, do fan art of a certain IP. This is someone else's creation. Like if they if they don't like what you're doing, like mm -hmm. you don't really have much ground to like fight back. Certainly, um, certainly. You know? I think most companies realize that it's like good for the community. It's like free promotion for them, as long as you're not like stepping on their toes in a lot of ways. And I think that's why you see a lot of places not going after people who are clearly, you know, profiting. But Ooh. again, that's just my opinion. If you get sued, not financial advice, not legal advice. No, that's true. Yeah, I feel like it's like pretty... It's definitely a gray area. It's definitely, yeah, it, I think at the end of the day, it's really just at the discretion of any of these companies and their creators and the right rights holders yeah because i think that people are scared that like if you make something and they take it down then like oh, what was it for right like what's the point like why did i even make it but i feel like there's other reasons why you make art so yeah and yeah. you still get to keep that you know i think it was last year or the year before your instagram got deleted it did yeah so how did that happen uh because i do fan art <laughs> so uh yeah I, I think um i have this like naruto piece that i did that uh, I guess caught someone's attention and mm -hmm. it got flagged. I didn't even really get any warnings. Like I, and it didn't tell you it that didn't it tell me. Yeah. There's nothing. I went to like, you know, sometimes you get like a strike, uh, notification or something. I didn't have anything. I just noticed that it was gone. And then the next day, uh, I tried locking in and I got locked out of my account and then still no notification. Yeah. Still no notification. And, um, it just, as I was trying to log back in it, then it gave me a notification saying like, your account will be suspended for like 14 days or something because you got some sort of like, whatever, uh, copyright notice violation thing. Okay. Um, yeah. I tried appealing it. Mm -hmm. And then the next day I log tried logging back in to at least like see the status of the appeal. And then it just said it was just deleted. Oh. So it was like right away. Okay. Um, so they didn't even give you the 14 days. They just. No, no, no. Yeah. It just, it escalated super quick. Because it's not like you sell fan art on Instagram. How no, does that and, even work? Right. And it, it wasn't like, I mean, I'm not the only one with an art to fan art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, there's definitely, like, <laughs> but, but very popular artists doing the same thing. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just like, oh, why is this happening to me? But then again, like I said, if you do fan art, this is just kind of... Things it's a risk kind of, you take. Yeah, it's just a risk you take. So... Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that happened. I mean, I'm still here. I still make art. <laughs> yeah, I guess, like, Instagram just doesn't want to deal with it. So if they get, like... If you get claimed or something, oh yeah, just for like, sure. No, it. yeah. If there's some official thing, like you're not gonna win that. Yeah. Make fan art, get bitches. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, I didn't say that. For my stuff, I go by the Chris Evans rule. If the show has a celebrity guest list, I don't go. Odds are high that the crowd is only there for the celebrity photo ops or signings, and then there's no money left for the rest of us. Do you have any thoughts on that? Probably depends on what type of work you're selling, and it probably depends on your price point. But all I will say is like big celebrities will probably bring in more people mm -hmm. and some people could be there for the autographs but sometimes people come in groups you know yeah, yeah. those other people might not really care about the autograph. yeah so bigger celebrities usually mean more people and uh if you have work that uh is supplementary or complements the experience that someone's going for well then then maybe it works out well for you you know but if, yeah. if you're making something that is almost in direct opposition, like taste-wise or experience-wise with someone, then yeah, you might not do as well. Yeah, yeah. So it definitely depends on, you know, what you're making. Like, it's all contextual, I feel like. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've definitely been to shows where that felt true, where it was like, um, like Megacon back in the day. It's, it's a little better now, but it used to be like, I think I was there, the first year I was there, like David Tennant was there and he was blowing up at the time. And it was very clear that like there was lines out the door, but it was only for him. And then like if you didn't have like Doctor Who stuff at the time, because it was kind of during that era, um, nobody cared. Yeah, that year that that show definitely sucked. But the fun thing is, David Tennant came to my booth oh, before the show one day, and I was like, I got this shit for free. Wow. So that was cool. You, so it was kind of my spiteful fuck you to those crowds that like never got did in. Did you give him anything or? Uh... No, I was awkward, but I, you know. He said hi and stuff, and he, wow. he complimented my work. I think he was doing that to like everybody, but I'll take it, I'll take the win. No. I think there's more external factors also. Like I think I've been to like very small local shows where then they like 
put all the cons budget into getting like a big celebrity and then charge like $70 for a signing and $70 to get through the door. Mm -hmm. When it's such a small local show like that, where it's not really bringing in people who travel, which mm -hmm. are typically people with a little bit more money mm -hmm. often, or like are saving up. Sure, sure to go to that show perhaps. I think that becomes a bigger factor and becomes more true. I think when it's like, you know, Anime Expo, San Diego, all these are the, you know, that type of thing. Like people travel for those shows for tons of different reasons. Keeping those things in mind. Also not all celebrities charge for photo ops. Not all celebrities yeah. charge for signings. Yeah, true. So like they're not always taking money out of, you know, the attendees pockets. Sometimes they're just bringing attendees to the show. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Artist Alley versus Dealer's Hall. Pros and cons as an artist. What is kind of the difference of setting up a booth in the Dealer's Hall versus an Artist Alley? Because I don't have a lot of experience in the Dealer's Hall. The biggest thing for me before was that usually you can re-up and be like grandfathered in for yeah. Dealer's Hall. And I feel like- So it's kind of a safety net in yeah, a way to make sure you like, get back in. Right, I feel like the cost is like, sometimes it's like eight times more. Yeah. Would I rather take that cut and still be able to live another year it was like a guarantee right yeah, yeah 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 you know so for me that's that was one of the reasons and then the second one would probably be um you usually have more flexibility with how you can set up yeah yeah for sure um, how do you feel profits are versus one or the other do you see a difference in that uh honestly not really i feel like it works out to be the same if anything i actually think you do better in artist alley that's what i've been because yeah, people are there to to shop for art right yeah you definitely get seen differently being in the dealer's hall um i feel like there's a different strategy to like setting up your booth too like it has to be much more grandiose to like be seen in such a big hall a lot of times yeah it's like it's like a whole different game sometimes because the context changes when there's different people next to you and also the mindset that people come in so just like, I usually just take a walk before every show. Uh, and sometimes before I set up, I'll just take a walk through the hall and just pretend as if I'm experiencing it for uh, like mm -hmm. as a customer, as an attendee, and just kind of figure out where my eyes go and where my attention goes. I feel like that's such great advice. Cause like, even if you're selling like work that uh, like might be the attendees like favorite thing there if they don't see your booth it doesn't matter yeah like that's the thing like w once you get into these halls a lot of it becomes more about like logistics you know mm -hmm. like, it's not always about the art and it's not always about the work it's like it's just the logistics of like did you catch their attention can they see you can they find you mm -hmm. like, and then like once they get to your booth then it comes about like interaction and experience you know and, mm -hmm. and that has nothing to do with the art either <laughs> like yeah, yeah you yeah. know the art is just kind of like a middleman sort of so how did you decide if shows were a good fit for you and when did you feel you were ready to start tabling at conventions most of my life i i, I spent like practicing like mm -hmm. that was like the first probably like 10 years, I was just like practicing. I just want to get better. There was no other goal, but I think just after so much time of like not doing anything and not showing, like not having anything to show for it, mm -hmm. I feel like that was starting to overwhelm my desire to get good. I just wanted to do, like I just wanted to utilize it in some way. I first started doing conventions or was like trying to make money with my art. I think my perception was so off which I think was, again, like we said earlier, was kind of helpful. Like if I knew that there was all these like super talented artists like in the space it would have definitely discouraged me a lot sooner. But because like, you know, I didn't know any other artists, like I felt like I was better than average, even sure. though it, that wasn't no, true. I think that's great, yeah. Um, and that kind of gave me the ego or confidence to like jump into things that I certainly wasn't ready for. But then I had done it and I was like, oh, well, if I had done this and this and this, that would have gone way better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that just kind of spiraled out of control until I actually got like decent <laughs> at doing conventions and making a profit. And I feel like knowing too much is actually the best way to not start something. Like it'll get you, you know? in your head, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Like there's just like, uh, yeah, it can like paralyze you and create so much self doubt. Yeah, I think for me, like I always just wanted to like paint whatever I wanted to paint and like make little pictures that I enjoyed and conventions was a way to like actually sustain like a living doing it. And I don't have to worry about an art director. So that was one of the biggest factors. Honestly, that's the funnest part, actually. Oh, when when we feel ready, you would never feel ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah you yeah. would never feel ready. Just do it before your mind catches up to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, before you know too much, just yeah, yeah. go. Don't think about it, just, yeah, yeah. If I may interject, you both actually hit on a really interesting point that mm -hmm. I think might be interesting for the video. 
A ghost just gave us <laughs> a ghost just gave us a suggestion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for uh, it. I think it'd be pretty interesting to know. Both of you touched on this idea of um, having made mistakes early on and wishing you had had uh, done something differently when you had first started doing conventions. Uh, so if either of you could speak to that, I think that that'd be uh, pretty interesting. I know I have one. Oh well, okay. Um, in the beginning, I used to um, I used to sell everything with frames. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and I, and I had to go out to like IKEA every week, basically, to restock on frames, and and I would frame everything, I would pre-frame everything, and our whole setup display had frames, and because we had frames, we needed grids, and and uh, we actually did that for like two years. It it meant that I had to drive everywhere, like I had to drive to every show. Ooh, yeah. I did like a fourteen-hour drive to Portland with all this equipment once. Oh no. Okay. And um, a, as your business grows and. And, and you start traveling more, like definitely think about th some of those logistics. Yeah, optimization for sure yeah, is like yeah. something I try to redo every year. I'm like, okay, what can I like make easier on the back end? Packing situation doesn't take two weeks. The things people are looking for might not be the same things you're looking for. Yeah. Thinking that they're important, you know? I put up these like big scroll banners just because I think they're eye catching, but nobody buys them, but they get people to come to my table. So like if I was just looking at like the numbers of them, I would have tore those down forever ago. Yeah. But again, in like a hall, it brings people over. Oh, and I used to, I used to print, we used to go through like this fine art printing service. 11 by 17 print costs like $20 a print oh, okay. to make. That yeah. was a big mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, figuring out like what actual like the cost of production like is because there's so many like high-end printing companies out there that like just overcharge for everything like in manufacturers too this kind of leads into another question that we got so it was what is the most profitable item for artists to make which is prints so there's that answer but it, then it goes into i am working on stickers as they are the most affordable for me to make but i can't see that paying for a table Oh, I mean, I know a lot of people that do really well with stickers, actually. I definitely think stickers are very popular. For me, I have a little issue with them. Um, I think, like, especially if you're starting out, stickers are so overpriced to manufacture, even from, like, sticker app, unless you're oh. buying in bulk of, like, oh, sure. three, four hundred. So yeah. unless you know that design is going to move, like, one sticker is, like, almost the same cost as, like, an 11 by 17 print if you're not nice. spending $25. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, like, the profit margins on there just are not equal. So, like, like your whole company either has to run around stickers, like, it has to be a major part of it to, like, be able to get those price breaks. Or I think, like, again, like, prints just have so such good profit margins on them. I'm a big, big believer in there's like a hole like everywhere. Like mm -hmm. I always like to try to go where someone's like not looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I mean, obviously if everyone's just selling prints and you're the only one with a different um, product, then, mm -hmm. then yeah, you might stand out and you might do really well, you know? Yeah, and um, then you can justify a different price margin too, or like a different yeah, price sure. break. Cause you have no competition. Uh, but I will say the thing about stickers is some convention centers themselves, they let the showrunners know that they don't want sticker vendors mm -hmm. because they end up seeing the stickers all around their property, like yeah, all yeah. around the like poles and bathrooms. And so, yeah, we're like, seeing more and more of them banning stickers yeah, for sale. Not yeah. all of them enforce it, but a lot of them do. I have been seeing that a lot. So I feel like with stickers specifically, that there might be like a, a different hurdle. So those are the majority of our community questions. What's your favorite con? Actually, I really love Gen Con. You love Gen, yeah. I do. Gen Con's I, awesome. Yeah, I feel like uh, it feels so communal mm -hmm. that I feel like I, I don't really feel as much, I guess, at other it's very unique. Events. Yeah, like they really, I think it's really cool that all, all the artists kind of get together. They still have like an award show. Yeah, yeah. the attendees are always so nice there. Yeah. The staff are great. Yeah. Like there's no complaints. Oh wait, what's your favorite one? It's either, it's either Gen Con or Dragon Con. They both have like, fun. Yeah. like immaculate yeah. vibes. Yeah, I really, it's really fun. Um, I like those. So where can people find you now? Uh, they can find me at, uh, on Instagram. Honestly, if anything, just sign up for my mailing list. If you actually want to like stay in contact, like mm -hmm. being on the mailing list is great. And there'll be a link for that down below. Well then I guess, thank you so much for yeah, joining me today. Yeah, man. yeah, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I appreciate you coming out. Yeah. I know it'll be fun. Bye community. Have you 
been sued into oblivion for fan art? Are you sitting in copyright jail right now? I've heard of other people getting cease and desist letters in person at events before. I've never seen it personally myself, but if you've had some sort of experience like this, I would love to hear about it in the comments below. Other than that, if you enjoyed this type of video, please like and subscribe. It helps me out a ton. Have a great day.